Garfield Todd, the New Zealand missionary who's become an African legend. I think our 56 years in Zimbabwe had been to us a time of tremendous fulfillment and blessing, and we are tremendously grateful that we were sent out from New Zealand in 1934 on a mission of which we had really no understanding that it turned out to be the most wonderful privilege. In 1934, Garfield and Grace Todd, with their two-year-old daughter, set out for southern Rhodesia and a remote mission station. Teacher and preacher on a short African adventure that turned into an epic. The preacher was to become prime minister and launch Rhodesia's last chance to avoid racial conflagration. I thought I'd achieved a lot, but there was only one thing to achieve, and that was to lay a political foundation on which you could build a non-racial community sharing in government, and I failed to do that. So we had to have a civil war, lose 40,000 people in deaths, but that wasn't the biggest cost. The biggest cost was the damage you did to the people themselves, so many wounded, so many homes broken up, so many homes burnt down. It was devastating, and that could have been avoided. Garfield Todd had seen civil war coming. Well before a shot was fired, he'd thrown his weight against the ruthless new government of Ian Smith in favour of black majority rule. The whites branded Todd a traitor. The blacks hailed him as a hero and martyr to the cause. Today, Rhodesia has given way to a peaceful multiracial Zimbabwe. Todd revels in a role of revered elder statesman. Zimbabweans know him not just as the preacher politician who was always on their side, but also as a doctor, farmer, teacher, businessman, and builder of schools and churches. I think everybody knows that. That was a long time ago. And the churches have grown and the schools have grown during the years. Even in his 80s, he cuts an impressive figure a man of old-fashioned virtues who's achieved renown as a radical. His ranch, deep in the veld, has become a symbol of the struggle for human rights. Hokanui Ranch, he calls it, after the Hokanui Hills of Southland, the place the Todds used to call home. Zimbabwe is home. But um, so much of our background, ourselves, our ideals, our standards, all, of course, came from New Zealand. Our ideas on race, Christianity, we all started in New Zealand. So naturally, we owe New Zealand a great deal. Garfield Todd came from Waikiki in Vicargill, son of a tile and brick maker whose ideals and standards couldn't have been less like those of a radical freedom fighter. My father being managing director of Thomas Todd and Sons Limited in Waikiki, um, he didn't think very much of trade unions and so on. Not that we had any trade unions anywhere around there at that time. So I would have thought that we were on the conservative side if I'd noticed. But the young Garfield did learn the value of a Christian upbringing as part of the flourishing Todd clan who were well known in Waikiki. And so we built up what was called Todd Town to a lot of people. Some of them called them the God Almighty Todds. But there it was, they were fairly religious people, but not too narrow in their attitudes. In fact, the Todd family's attitudes seem to have been a mixture of stern idealism and earthy practicality. Garfield's father made sure his son had a rounded education. My father was quite sure that you started at the lowest level, so I was put into the clay pits, and I and two other men had to get down 50 tons of clay a day, and it's very hard work. So by the time I was 18, I was really a fit man. But manual labor wasn't enough for the idealistic teenager, and in 1927, he left for Dunedin to enter the Glen Leith Theological College. In my day, it had a very fine principal, particularly a Dr. Haddon, an Australian, and he maybe had a bigger influence on my life than almost anyone, in some ways anyway, because he was quite sure that all life and work 
was part of religion, and therefore you you approached everything from the point of view that it was it was worthy, it was good, and you did it properly and to the best of your ability. Todd graduated to become a minister in the small town of Amaru. Our Amaru was was beautiful. Everything was beautiful. The gardens were beautiful. The streets were wide. People were very proud of their town, but they'd arrived. Here, the people hadn't started. I didn't feel I was needed. That was the point. It's a very different thing. Of course, when we came out here, your need was so great you never were able to meet it. That was the other extreme. So it was that Garfield and his wife Grace, a teacher from Winton in Southland, set sail for the other extreme. They took with them a set of values. A moral code which they've never forgotten. I think that's one of the things we've got to be very pleased about with our New Zealand upbringing and experience. Uh, it, it's, it, it is still, I'm sure, and was then a very egalitarian society, very homogeneous, no great wealth, no great poverty, everybody equal. And we had no reason to think of it being different when we went to another country. It was different, of course, as Garfield's homemade films from the period show. Not only were the customs different, not only did the people lack the most basic comforts, but what the Todds seemed to find most different were the attitudes they found in white-ruled Rhodesia. When you got here, of course, you found problems immediately. I mean, and you couldn't go with an African person anywhere couldn't go into a hotel or a restaurant or anything else. I mean, to think, for example, of a black and a white marrying in this country, if a, a civil servant was found in any relationship, a male with a black female, he'd be out of the civil service in those years. I mean, it was, a, it was the crime. On the whole, uh, the ordinary white people who came out here from Britain and up from South Africa and so on, regarded this as a new country and with cheap labor force and therefore they really looked upon missions who were establishing schools through the country as a disturbing element. And uh, bringing Africans, bringing them into schools and educating was really making them sort of above their station. That was the feeling amongst the white people when we came. The Todds came to the remote New Zealand Church of Christ Mission at Dadaya and were to have little contact with the parochial white community. It's a very strong pressure on you when the white community as such looks down on a race. It's very difficult to keep your, your standing, I think, under those circumstances. There were other missionaries, but because of the depression and health and various things, they were all withdrawn. And within a matter of a month or two, we were the two whites. So, of course, we were then on our own and we made our own behavior patterns. And our board in New Zealand, they were greatly distressed to think of these two young people and one little girl living in darkest Africa with no other white people to talk to. Well, it was 13 years before the next couple came. The Todds were free to ignore white opinion and treat their neighbors as fellow human beings. Though the relationship wasn't always one of equals. Garfield was immediately regarded as an expert in everything from agriculture to architecture and medicine and he accepted the role. He decided he couldn't just officiate at weddings. He had to use his broad education to help his parishioners. He had to become, for example, a physician and midwife. I'd had five years of St John's, which I, I rate as reasonable for first aid work. But you see, you had castor oil, that was for stomachs. You had aspirin, that was for headaches and so on. You had uh, motor oil, which was right for burns. You had quinine, which although it didn't cure malaria, it was all that they could give. As far as delivering babies is concerned, nature looks after most of that. Eventually one delivered Grace's babies and hundreds of babies around the place. Yeah. When it came to their own children, Garfield delivered two of Grace's daughters. The elder, Judith, appeared to be in her father's mould, a born leader, soon fascinated by politics. I'd been born into what I didn't recognise at the time was being a black community. 
But afterwards, when I had to go to a white school in Svishavani, it was then that I started realising about race. I discovered very soon that if you were the daughter of a missionary, you were suspect because missionaries uh, had something to do with black people, so they were suspect. And so kids would come up and say, uh, is it true that your father is a missionary? And I'd say, no, he's a New Zealander. Judith was to become her father's closest ally. Together, they were to stand up to speak out against and at times face the wrath of Ian Smith's rebel white government. To the population around Hokanui Ranch, the name Todd is very dear indeed. Dozens of men brought into the world by Todd the midwife have been named in his honour. I am Todd. <laughs> well, there's two Todds. Yeah, I, I am Todd Mangena. <laughs> so we've met the two Todds. Yeah. I was told the story how I got my name because he helped my mother. It is when I was given birth on the 5th of January 1944. That was 1944. Yeah, for sure. That, Back that's then, the Garfield died. Todd had been passing a remote mud hut when he was called to tend a sick woman lying under a blanket. So I took the, the blanket off and found to my absolute horror that a baby had been born, you. Yes. <laughs> the baby was lying more or less between your mother's feet. Yes. And then next was the placenta, still connected to the baby. To the baby yeah. But then the terrible thing was that this is something that only happens, I believe, in once in a couple of hundred or three hundred thousand cases. The whole womb was inverted and was out of, the, of your mother. So I took the soap and, and washed as carefully as I could and got it as clean as I could and then inserted it again where it ought to be. Yes. But I had no packing or anything like that. I knew she hadn't got a hope. But yeah. six weeks later, to my absolute amazement, I heard that both the mother and the baby were alive. I was yeah, so sure. happy. Yeah, but sure. then, of course, I heard she'd had three more children after that. Yes. Right? Yeah. Marvellous. Congratulations yeah. to you and to your mother. <laughs> I would like God to help you for your help. And I'm still living. <laughs> <laughs> so am I, which is much more remarkable. So Garfield Todd brought people into the world, cared for them, prayed for them, married and buried them. He was also responsible for their education. Today, he's guest of honour back at the school, which was the centre of his mission station. Here, he's still accorded the title Mfandisi, great teacher. But one of the most important things, although I didn't know it at the time, <clears throat> that I ever did after I came to this country was to marry a certain young man and a certain young woman who came from Mapanzure school. Their name was Dube, they had children, and one of them was a very fine little boy called Noyce. Will you stand up please, Noyce? <laughs> Noyce Dube, the butt of the great teacher's sense of humour, now presides over one of Zimbabwe's most prestigious schools. But it wasn't always so. The first school here was more modest. Built back in the 1930s by Garfield Todd, the architect. Those brick-making skills learned in Waikiwi had proved invaluable. The building is still in use half a century later as a primary school. We built that. That was the first one, first big building we built. We made the bricks. Yes. Burned them, you remember? Yes, I remember that. Made a clamp kill, you know, they put the, the wood in amongst the bricks and then you set fire to the whole thing and the bill burned perhaps 70,000 bricks. One, is one of the present day teachers was a pupil when the school was built. 
Her most vivid memory is of the young woman who took her for lessons at the time, Grace Todd. Mrs. Todd was there. Yes, as well as good at sewing. Yeah, and the PE. PE, yes, <laughs> yes. We used to drill here. It's where I was. Always my drill instructor was always with me here. Grace, drill instructor and all-round teacher, was to become a great pioneer of Rhodesian education. It's very difficult for anybody, it's difficult for Africans here in this country to remember what conditions were like way back in that time. They had absolutely no teaching aids whatever. And of course one's heart went out to these people trying to cope, teaching children with nothing. And so that was the thing that started me off on, on the provision, providing of material for the schools. Grace Todd devised a remarkable textbook for her teachers, a book which laid down what should be taught on each day of the year, in each subject to each class. In retrospect, she admits her notes of lessons provided a rather primitive and regimented curriculum, but they met a vital need in a country which put scarcely any store on African education. It was just designed for our own poor teachers who had no assistance at all. But when other schools got to know that this was available, of course, they wrote in asking for copies of these notes of lessons. By the time I became Prime Minister, they were in use in all the schools throughout the country. The Dyer School eventually took on secondary pupils, moved to a site on Hokanui Ranch, and grew at a dramatic rate, gathering a reputation for formidable academic success. The school that Todd's built is now alma mater to many of the men and women who led Zimbabwe to nationhood and who became leading lights in the government. For years, Todd the churchman was content on his mission. But then in the local mining town of Shabani, a freak event propelled him into politics. In 1943, Prime Minister Godfrey Huggins made an address at the Nilton Hotel. He happened to criticise New Zealand's welfare state. Huggins, it was fairly forthright in his statements, said some pretty horrible things about New Zealand. And I had quite recently come back from New Zealand. And of course, I'd been in New Zealand quite a long time in the beginning. And I was furious at what he was saying. So I got up and asked, her, I suppose, about a 10 minute political question. But I wasn't discussing with him his policy for the future. I was just saying that this wasn't fair, what he was saying about New Zealand. So, of course, uh, the, the Huggins and the manager of the mine, who was the chairman of the night, they had a quick consultation and closed down the meeting. They thought this wasn't going to be a good meeting. The long question put Huggins off his stride, but the Prime Minister realised that New Zealander might be a political asset. Well, I told the Prime Minister, I said, this is nonsense putting me up as a member of Parliament. They'll never vote for me. Huggins was asking Todd to stand as a candidate for a right-wing party in an all-white Parliament. It would certainly be a strange place for a man who had already likened Rhodesia's government to Hitler's Germany. But to Garfield and Grace, the missionaries, the white Parliament represented a new political mission. We had had 20 years at the mission, and that seemed, it does still seem, a very long spell. Uh, looking back, I think of it as being almost the most important 20 years that I spent in Africa. But this came up as the next opportunity of serving. It seemed to us that the key to the future was to try to persuade the whites that the blacks were the most important potential in this country. Uh, the mining was pot a great potential, the agriculture and so on, but the population was black and the whites had rather, a, well, almost a contempt for the black population. So we thought maybe that I, who had lived so closely amongst the people, might have some sort of a message for the uh, parliament, for the whites. <laughs> 
and eventually we decided that we would, we would, uh, I would stand. But would the white electorate accept the messenger? By now, Todd had built up from scratch the 48,000 acre farm that he still runs today. He was a commanding figure, physically large, genial, and with the air sometimes of a lord of the manor. However unconventional his views on such issues as the local natives, a rancher like that had to be all right. I made my first address in the constituency on what was called the native question, and I made it quite clear. Well, they listened, but they thought I was mad and that my views on the native question were absolutely irrelevant to the reality. So, by dint of his personality, rather than his politics, Todd was elected to the backbenches of Parliament where he was to rub shoulders with another future Prime Minister, Ian Smith. Well, his views differed from mine. In those days, he was a backbencher in Parliament, and so was I, and he was a normal backbencher. I spoke to him, got on quite well with him. He, although he was a missionary, he had a ranch down in the part of the country that I come from, and occasionally we used to swap ideas about ranching and about cattle. When he was elected the leader of the party, it was a bit of a, a bolt out of the blue. I don't think anybody, nobody I knew certainly anticipated and predicted that. Garfield's ascendancy to the Prime Ministership was surprising for all sorts of reasons. He was inexperienced. With only seven years in Parliament, he was the first missionary ever to lead a government. And above all, he was a Liberal with a conservative white electorate. But any doubts about him were quickly dispelled when thousands of black miners went on strike at the country's largest coal mine. Prime Minister Todd acted firmly. He sent in the army. I gave him top marks for that because I believe it's difficult, I think, to disagree with me that law and order is absolutely basic and fundamental. If you allow law and order to break down, then that's the end of civilization. So there were things like that which he did which surprised me pleasantly so. Bringing out the army, I mean, is obvious for breaking a strike, but bringing out the army to make sure that nobody got killed and nobody got killed it was, a, I think, a sound move. And I'd do it again today if the same circumstances arose. Gradually, Todd introduced changes to improve civil rights for blacks, while his charisma and decisiveness kept him on side with whites. The balancing act lasted five years. But I was quite popular until I started thinking of giving votes to blacks. <laughs> Already he tried to improve African education, putting himself in charge of a ministry for that purpose. And he passed a law forbidding whites from calling their black workers boy. Now, finally, he planned to extend the franchise. He wanted to give the vote to some of the richer, more qualified blacks, a small step, but Todd had to restrain himself. He had to move slowly to achieve his goal of native reform. Oh, yes, this was terribly frustrating. And also to suggest things that were just half what you wanted and so on. But, you know, one thinks one's being wise, and I was not only going as carefully as I thought I could, but I was going far quicker than I could maintain. And everything that he did was designed to liberalise the system and bring Africans into government. Right from the earliest days, he recognised that unless Africans were brought into the process of government, sooner or later there would be confrontation. And it was his aim to... Uh, avoid that confronta confrontation. By the end, Todd's support came less from his white colleagues and more from the small but growing black political movement, the African National Congress, led by Joshua in Como. He was trying to further the, the oneness of the people of his country. Zimbabwe become his country. <laughs> 
and he had a very difficult task. He could not go as far as he would have liked to go. Ultimately, he went too far. On his return from an overseas trip in 1958, he was confronted by his cabinet and dumped as prime minister. The pretext? That he'd been arrogant and dictatorial. Within months, Todd was out of parliament altogether. A more right-wing government was in, and the country lost whatever chance it had of a peaceful transition to a multiracial future. And when I was thrown out, that was the time when there was a great new influx of members to the African National Congress because they gave up hope that under any white man they would get far. Todd himself gave up that hope as well. He formed his own party and hit the hustings to promote racial integration. The new party wouldn't succeed. Most of its supporters were black and couldn't vote. But at least Todd was free. So he had now given himself completely uh, to fight uh, an, a system which to him and to us all was evil. He had no constraints that he had when he was in, 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 in parliament or when he was uh, prime minister. He was expelled and, 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 and called a, a, a black lover. I mean, the whole background of working with, between Africans and whites at that time, I think whites shouldn't work with Africans except on the basis of master and servant. And if you did, and if you had um, fellowship, and if you had social occasions, and if you were friendly with people, it was all counted against you. What Todd wanted at first was still gradual change. He believed the country wasn't ready for majority rule, but his views and those of the blacks were changing fast. But even up to 1960, after I'd left, the African people were saying, let us have this or give us that from the white government. But by 61 or 62, they were saying, let us have a black government. Now, Todd joined them wholeheartedly in the call for complete democracy. But as he did so, the rest of White Rhodey's show ran in the opposite direction. They chose as Prime Minister the uncompromising Ian Smith. Smith set up a white fortress. He cut all ties with colonial Britain and set the stage for conflict. I don't believe in black majority rule ever in Rhodesia. Not in a thousand years. To preserve white domination, Smith was to detain without trial those who opposed him, black or white. Right from the start, Garfield Todd was a victim of the Smith regime's tough tactics. Just before the Declaration of Independence, he was put under house arrest. Well, it's not very pleasant after having lived in Rhodesia for 31 years and having tried to serve the country uh, to be placed in really what is a comfortable imprisonment without trial. I'm old-fashioned. I, I don't believe in imprisonment without trial. Could you tell us the terms of your restriction? Well, uh, yes. Uh, I'm not to go away from the area of land which is owned by the Hockanui Ranching Company Limited. For 12 months, Todd was stuck at the ranch. The idea, it seems, was to silence him. He'd been preparing a speech to give in Edinburgh, and Smith feared he might form a government in exile while he was away. In the event, while Garfield languished at home, his daughter Judith took his place on the overseas lecture circuit. And she did him proud. Once in Britain, she mustered mass demonstrations against Smith's rebel government. By the time she came home, she was a subject of mass media interest. Her fame, or notoriety, had preceded her to Rhodesia. I've done all that I can in Canada, New York and Britain. I can't do any more outside the country. And I think that it's time for Rhodesians to come home and demonstrate their opposition to Smith. How old are you, Mr. 22. Do you consider yourself sufficiently mature to shoulder the problems of Rhodesia? No, I'm not shouldering the problems of Rhodesia, but I'm a Rhodesian and therefore I'm involved. Both Judith and her father became involved more than they wanted. 
1972, they were arrested and detained, each in solitary confinement. If before the Todd family doubted Smith's ruthlessness, now they doubted no longer. You know, you can live in a country where uh, it's legal to uh, detain people without trial, but when it actually happens to somebody in your own family, you can hardly believe it. I couldn't really believe that we, who had been law-abiding citizens all our lives, uh, could find ourselves in the situation where my husband and my daughter were taken off to detention. Uh, I didn't at the beginning know that detention meant a prison cell. But when they came and presented us with detention orders, I must say that my heart fell because we had so many people in this country, so many friends who had been detained since 1963, 4, 5, and there was no sign of them getting out. You see uh, broad arrows on the pillows and uh, so on was a bit of a shock. There was a tremendous fear I always saw on the part of the whites to allow me to have any contact with blacks. That was a great fear. So anyway, there was this tiny courtyard and I went out in the morning of the first morning and uh, there was a little peephole with two little bars. I was standing looking out on the courtyard. Of course, I was the only white prisoner in a big black prison. And the voice said, are you all right, sir? And I said, yes, I'm fine, thank you, and went away. A while later, the fingers of a black hand came through the bars and I put my hand over it. And then that was, I think, called solidarity. Next morning when I was ready to come out, of course, they had to open the cell door to let me out into the little courtyard. So there were two locks to be opened. But there was a lot of noise, a lot of hammering and so on. And when I was allowed out and came into the little courtyard, I found a steel plate had been put over the little peephole so that I was then really on my own. It's so funny, so peculiar that people should be so frightened of a contact. But it was no game and Judith decided to play rough herself. She staged a hunger strike. Now, I didn't know what a hunger strike was. I'd read about it in history books to do with the suffragettes or something. But it was the only weapon that I had, which I thought if I managed also to get this information out, would bring more pressure through the press on the regime to release us, which is what happened at the end of the day. It was actually quite a successful tactic. The tactic brought the plight of both daughter and father to the very forefront of international attention. When we were in prison, uh, Edward Kennedy and the Prime Minister of New Zealand, and all sorts of people, more than I knew, protested to Smith. And I think that was the reason why, after five weeks, he led Judith and me out. But for Garfield, it wasn't to be very far. While Judith went into exile in Britain, her father was dumped back on his ranch in Haldir, forbidden any contact with the outside world. Not easy for a man of boundless energy, though infinitely better than a prison cell. I didn't know I was going to be here for four and, four and a half years, but even at that, uh, to be home was wonderful. I wasn't allowed, of course, to go more than 800 paces from the house, and they had in the first the weeks uh, a white policeman at the end of that little road there. Uh, sitting in the jeep to make sure that I stayed here. Uh, he got very bored. He used to come up for tea, which I was, thought was rather sweet. In those four and a half years of isolation, even Garfield's good humour was tested. To occupy himself, he built first a swimming pool and then a giant weir across the river at the bottom of the garden. He coped. His surroundings were idyllic, but the tranquility wasn't to last. While he couldn't go and see the outside world, the outside world was slowly coming to Hokanui Ranch. By the time he was released from house arrest, the countryside was engulfed in civil war. Some of the fiercest fighting around the Todd homestead. We could at least see the gunships you know, coming in and, and bombing the, uh, that mountain that you can see at the head of the valley here. 
It was very, very tense. It was always very tense. One wondered in the night when the dog barked uh, whether it was friend or foe who was approaching. And on one occasion it happened to be a group of black men with rocket launchers on their shoulders and guns in their hands came running across the lawn. And that again wasn't a very uh, pleasant moment. For well, the moment it was a very... But it turned out that they were guerrillas. And they came and sat all over here and uh, asked for news and asked for food. The Todd supplied food from the shops they now owned on the ranch, often using as go-between stores manager Christine. She dealt directly with Mujibas, the guerrillas' support staff. We used to have the Mujibas, one would call them, the young boys and girls who would sort of be sent by the freedom fighters to him for some help. Well, most of the time they really required cigarettes and uh, walking shoes. They didn't have walking boots and things like that. It was a tough time for both the people who lived around and uh, those, of course, who were aiding the freedom fighters. It was more dangerous. The danger was extreme. The Todds knew that aiding guerrillas was a capital offence, but they did so willingly. They knew from the beginning, though it was an agonising decision, that they had to take sides. The blacks were very much my friends. We had been concerned with churches and schools, and now they were being repressed, and uh, it was all so stupid and horrible. Um, but I had to go along with them, and I wanted to go along with them. I didn't want to go along with killing and so on, but there came the point where that was what was going to make the change. It's a terrible position for people to be in. You have to recognize that this was a situation of war. There was, it was a horrible civil war, with both sides using all the facilities that they could to... Um, to overcome the other side. So that wherever your sympathies were, whichever side, if you like to say it like that, you were supporting, you were supporting people who were using violence. But when I saw the violence of the government, the hurt, the burnings of villages, the killing of children, just one little group came into our grinding mill here, for example, and uh, there were some security people there. There were two or three donkeys, and the people and the mealies on the donkey's back. And there was a little 10-year-old boy too. And when they came round the corner and saw the security people, the security people said, halt to play. And the little boy ran and they just shot him like a rabbit. Garfield Todd felt compelled to do more than just provision the freedom fighters. He also treated their wounded. Among them, Christine's brother-in-law, a Majiba wounded in a helicopter attack. It showed First bullet, uh, the uh, freedom fighter uh, who was just near me. He lost his head. And another friend of mine was shot just here on, 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 the, on the chest. He died terribly. I was shot on the right hand side. I moved to a nearby home. They really hurried to, 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 to Mr. Garfield Todd, tell him what had happened. And early in the morning, he came to me and corrected me. I went to, 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 to die there for treatment. Oh, well, he saved his life. I'm sure that boy still owes it to him. <laughs> we were very closely attached to the people around here and they were suffering and we could help in many ways. We had come out as missionaries, perhaps this was a continuation of something of the same motivation, because we could help and did help a great deal during the war. And some of the people themselves, our dear friends amongst the Africans, really wanted us to leave because they thought that we would not come through safely. The manager of the next farm over here was killed. One weekend, my best friend, about 20 miles away on a farm, was killed. We were one of the few missions in the country 
I don't know if there are any others who managed to keep all our schools open all through the war. And when Mugabe, President Mugabe, was told about this at a public meeting one day, he said, well, your relationships with the guerrillas must have been very good if you didn't have to close down one school during the war. And they were good the relationships. Throughout the years of civil war, many white farmers lost their lives, others lost herds of cattle. The Todds, who spurned the use of security fences or radio alert systems, lost nothing. At the height of the fighting, Grace would sometimes sit at the cattle dip, waiting for the government vet inspectors to make their regular call. She unarmed, the vets guarded to the hilt. Then they would arrive and the white men would come over and greet me very fully armed with revolvers and guns on their shoulders and so on. But the African soldiers would rush out of their truck and take up positions round the outside of the dip with their guns facing out into the uh, felt around us, into the farm around us to protect the two white men who were there. And we would go through the process then of uh, counting the cattle and examining them for disease. And in due course, the signal will be given that it was finished and the men would rush in, get into the trucks and drive off, leaving me, this old white woman with white hair, sitting at the dip in the midst of this very dangerous situation. I always thought it was a little bit funny. Thank you, Elias. Thank you. Now you'll be going back to number nine at the back tomorrow morning. Yes. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. In 1980, Rhodesia finally became a truly independent, multiracial Zimbabwe. It was the end of one of the bloodiest struggles in Commonwealth history and of a long crusade by the Todd family. From 1958 until 1980 is a long span and all of that time we were waiting for independence. So that we were fortunate we were the ones who lived through and saw our dreams come true. And when the day came that Rhodesia became Zimbabwe and Mugabe had won an election and a, a black government, a majority government was formed, I too felt liberated. The independence celebrations were only just over when the new Prime Minister, Robert Mugabe, invited Garfield Todd to be a senator in the new Zimbabwean parliament, a political rehabilitation enjoyed by the Todds. I had lived all those years after Garfield's defeat in parliament, um, knowing that he was, was denigrated by the European uh, community, not by the Africans, and always hoped that somehow or other the day may come that he would live long enough, actually, to find that his policies had been vindicated uh, and that people would understand and appreciate what he had done, what he had suffered in this cause. We were fighting for democracy, for non-racialism, for justice, and it appeared to me that we were part of a struggle that had been continuing throughout the world, throughout society. So I was really in step with at least the universe, even if not in step with the rulers of Rhodesia. I never had any doubts. I'm not the one that should be quoting religious texts, but I think what perhaps propelled both of my parents was that commandment, love thy neighbour as thyself. And if you do that, then you have no worries, political or otherwise. <laughs> Mount Wedza. A hundred years ago, it watched over the Matabele as they fought and lost their land to the white man. A dozen years ago, it saw the whites, in their turn, fight and lose. Today, it bears witness to a cooperative, a symbol of the new, more harmonious Zimbabwe, a farm run by guerrillas who were wounded in the Civil War. The first cattle were donated by the New Zealand High Commission. The land a gift from Garfield Todd.
a whole lot of wounded ex-combatants, uh, guerrillas, and we were in the position to be able to hand over 3,000 acres to them and set up a, an agricultural co-op. So we felt that was a privilege and the family was, uh, had the land and was able to do it. We'd wanted to do more in the past and been frustrated. This time we were able to do it. They sometimes look to see if any of the bite has come off. <laughs> the cooperative was the brainchild of Judith Todd, who now works to rehabilitate former guerrillas, and who's still her father's political ally. It was quite a big gesture in the sense that he still had an overdraft on the property, and uh, that would have been giving away at that stage the equivalent, I think, of about thirty thousand dollars. But. The, the balance was who was receiving it. And the people who were receiving it were people who had been, whose parents had been dispossessed from their land, who had fought for their land, and who had been permanently wounded. So really, it was less of a gift than a gesture of solidarity. And I think that those whites in this country who are still afflicted with racism are in a very unhappy situation and they will not be free from themselves until they start thinking of themselves as Zimbabweans. But I think their children will be fine. But Sir Garfield Todd's solidarity with modern Zimbabwe isn't all embracing. The country's not without its problems. At one stage, it looked as if democracy was going to be strangled in its infancy. A one-party state was threatened by Mugabe's ZANU-PF government. Todd was one of the few who dared speak out. An elder statesman, but still something of a radical, he travelled to the capital to counsel the nation's business people that the struggle for freedom didn't end with the civil war. And there's the thought that freedom is something that whites have and which they've kept away from blacks. And so today, it's freedom, white man, we've won. Freedom is a very, very valuable possession, a very valuable thing which can easily be lost even in a new black community. Because of his outspokenness, Todd's relationship with the government is not as good as it once was. Even so, he's still invited to an important official ceremony, a state funeral at Heroes Acre, the resting place for Zimbabwe's most revered citizens. This time, it's the writer, Willie Mazura. Perhaps Todd may have the honor of being the only white to be laid to rest at Heroes Acre when time forces him to leave his beloved country. At 82, one knows one's not going to be here so much longer. And of course, the Apostle Paul once said that uh, to depart from this life is much better. But I sometimes wondered if the Apostle Paul had lived in Zimbabwe, whether he would have been quite so emphatic. Sir Garfield Todd is still too robust to be thinking of the next world. But as he visits Zimbabwe's other great burial place, the grave of Cecil Rhodes, he can look back at his own life with few regrets. Oh, could anybody live to 80 and not have some regrets? But um, I think the causes that I've supported have been the correct ones, yes. A happy and fulfilled man. <laughs> <laughs> 
program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.